So uh, can I please invite now um, Betsabe and um, Betsabe and Gonzalo, right? Uh, to do the presentation. Thank you very much uh, for this. Thank you. Uh, can you see my presentation? Yes. Okay, perfect. Uh, so hello everyone. My name is uh, Betsabe. I'm a physics teacher from Chile. Uh, I'm a bit ashamed that I can't speak Portuguese uh, since I'm from South America as well, which says a lot about our education, right? Like put some priorities in other kinds of languages instead of the one within our own continent. So now I think that I'm looking forward to learn Portuguese so I can learn more about your work and maybe talk to you at some point with the people like involved in this uh, seminar. Uh, I have been doing my PhD research in the UK since 2018. And before that, I worked in a public school in my city in Valparaiso for six years and as a physics teacher educator uh, for pre-service uh, physics teacher at the university as well. Um, and I work now with science teachers, uh, communities, and my PhD research explores the concept of agency through a Freudian lens. So briefly, because uh, I'm not going to talk about my, my research in particular today, but briefly, my research uh, tries to conceptualize agency uh, while learning with teachers that are part of two communities outside the workplace, where its members are school teachers and teacher educators, uh, trying to problematize their pedagogical practice together. Um, if we explore um, how the concept of agency has been studied in science education literature, um, except for some exceptions, of course, uh, we can see that the focus has been mainly on a student's critical agency or in teachers responding to different contextual issues such as a new curriculum or a new reform uh, or assisted on implementing uh, different policies, for example. Uh, but in my research, the focus is on teachers' agency, not necessarily as a response or adaptation, but on teachers like reflections and actions moving towards a socially just work through, through the learning of science. And to do that, I conceptualize agency through the concept of hope, uh, autonomy, and being more. And uh, I have been exploring issues such as uh, how the teachers and teacher educators take the possibilities they have to problematize the condition they and their student live and also how they relate to each other, like between the university and the school, like, like some, sometimes power dynamics. So kind of like reading the world together in these communities and also uh, how they dream and imagine that a different world is possible. So like writing the world as well and thinking collectively from their communities and then try to distribute this sense of agency to other uh, spaces, such as the school for the school teachers and the universities for uh, teacher educators. So like kind of trying to read and write the work, but collectively with other people. So in doing so, um, one key aspect is to think about uh, who we are as science teachers, uh, which is what I'm going to uh, share today. And today I would like to share some experiences and ideas about how could, how could we embrace a critical pedagogy stand, but uh, also what are some of the tensions that stop us from doing it? Um, and I will also invite a friend and colleague uh, from Chile, Gonzalo, to share a bit of his experience working with this uh, philosophy with a practical and like, more, more concrete example. Uh, so maybe the reason why many of us are here uh, is that we have the, convic the conviction that critical pedagogies are not a series of methods, uh, but involves praxis, right? Praxis in the sense of uh, what we think, uh, what we do, uh, that we believe that something different in this world is, is possible, that we believe that it's possible to change the structures that constrain the life of certain people, and that we believe that we can live with the world in a more democratic and uh, sustainable way, and who we are is crucial in, the, in this task, and who we are as science teachers in particular uh, is important because our position as science teachers, uh, we can see the intersection between different types of knowledge uh, that give us like a privileged position to act toward that democratization and sustainable way. So critical pedagogies are not a framework to apply uh, to the way we teach only, for instance, but also uh, how we take the spaces we have and democratize them, making them more participatory, inclusive, less hierarchical, with shared authority, and with an acknowledgement of people agency. 
and it also has to do with with what kind of relationships uh, we build and what kind of things we stand against as well. Uh, so now I'm going to talk about who we are as science teachers. Uh, well, who we are as science teachers is shaped by our context and historical conditions in which scientific knowledge plays uh, a role as well. And where we come from, the position uh, of teachers within that context, for example, how science is valued or not uh, by people. Uh, if it's science, for example, like an elite knowledge or, or not, or it's just for a few, or if it's open for everyone. Um, and for us, the one who grew up in Latin America, there is usually a deep neoliberal culture uh, and also a culture of silence. So we sometimes avoid to talk about some things in certain places like the university, for example, um, that was imposed, this, this culture of silence was imposed within the dictatorship and that framed the views and approaches uh, of our teachers when we were in the school, of our families as well, like families also have this authoritarian way of uh, uh, working sometimes. And uh, so the, all these things like shape who we are today as, as science teachers. Uh, also our biographies, the stories uh, we have with the discipline at the school as students, uh, at the university while uh, preparing ourselves to become science teachers, or when working, preparing future, future uh, science teachers as well, uh, working usually in a science faculty. Uh, and also our political stand and, and how do we understand teachers' role as knowledge, knowledge producers or knowledge consumers of someone else's uh, ideas, for example. Uh, I guess that if we are here, it's because we recognize uh, teachers as knowledge producers and the political role teachers have in influencing uh, other people's views or the relationship we create with others as well. And the need for bringing politics back to, um, to, to science education, because otherwise we will continue having other people appropriating scientific knowledge for their own advantage. For example, how the misrepresentation of science is used to take positions such as trans rights or against reproductive rights and, more, and a lot of other things. Uh, I think that Arthur has a paper about that, so that's, that's a good one to start. And there is also a structure that facilitates and constrains uh, a critical stand, a structure such as national policies for teachers' work, like national assessment, uh, that constrain our time to think on certain things, to get organized, to collaborate with other people, uh, the science curriculum, uh, when it's presented, represented and understood as a prescription and as something fixed, for example, uh, or the productivity logic within the university and the neoliberal values that are embedded within, uh, within the university, like meritocracy or like individualism. So if we reflect back, and when I do this exercise of reflecting back uh, to my story, like trying to uh, become a, a science teacher and, and, and still, or like, I try to think about this thing. Probably many of us uh, did not have, at least I didn't have, critical pedagogies as the way we were educated uh, to become like science teachers. So unlearned banking and authoritarian pedagogies is a difficult thing because it's a normal thing for many of us in our, in our story. And this also showed that task for the transformation of science education is not only for, for a school science teacher, but also for teacher educators that we, there are not many research on teacher educator practices, for example, but a lot about teachers as if they, if, if they were the only one who need to change when there are other people that also need to change. And we need to, we need to, to reflect, for example, in the kind of pedagogies that a teacher educators embrace uh, when working with pre-service teachers as Haida was sharing yesterday, for example. And science education, even though it has been changing recently, thanks to the effort of many people in different places in the world, uh, is still a conservative field. And who we are as science teachers is shaped by hegemonic views within the field because we are educated usually in science faculties where there is a predominant view of disciplinary, disciplinary knowledge as an elite kind of knowledge and particularly in physics uh, faculties more. That's, that's a sorry yeah. for interrupting. It's uh, feedback from the translators. Uh, oh, okay. If you can slow down just a little yeah. bit. Uh, okay, thank sorry. you. Sorry. <laughs> All right. I'm sorry. Uh, so, for example, some researchers have shown uh, different types of hierarchies uh, within science disciplines uh, that are more deep sometimes in physics uh, faculties. Uh, hierarchies like, uh, for example, instead of having an integral initial education where everything weighs the same, uh, 
there is like this epistemic hierarchy that is reproduced by, for example, the tendency to reproduce a view where scientific knowledge is more important to other kinds of knowledge, like uh, pedagogical knowledge or contextual knowledge. Uh, so they put more weight in scientific disciplines when we are like educating ourselves uh, to become a science teacher. Uh, also, the idea of citizenship that Isabel was sharing yesterday, a little bit about that. Uh, so how, how we understand students as usually future citizens, creating hierarchies between uh, adults and young people, and denying their agency and the role in society today, uh, because they are, they are uh, members of the society today. And also research approaches working on or about people Instead, in, instead of uh, with people, creating usually deficit narratives about other actors, such as teachers or students. Uh, and of course, this is changing, which is good, but we need to uh, push that a little bit more. Uh, and also, there is a tendency to have a fragmented view of the world, separating the social from the natural, as if the world wasn't transdisciplinary. And those views, uh, those hierarchies, permeate our educational praxis and how we understand teacher practice in a small things such as our assessment practices, the relationship between science and the social world, the student's role in knowledge production, and the intersection of science and other ways of knowing to understand uh, the world. So how can we change that? How can we unmake ourselves uh, within the frame of a neoliberal culture where its norm and values permeate uh, who we are and also how can we unmake those, those values? And also trying to reshape our subjectivity and identities as critical educators in, in a constant making and learning. And we need to have a spaces to rethink who we are. And one easy way of doing it is by thinking with others, like in this seminar, for example, I think that we are all learning with others in this space and to problematize who we are as science teachers and who we want to be as well and how to achieve that in concrete, in concrete actions. And so some people call these spaces like, um, to use a Freudian uh, uh, language, like uh, places for cultivating hope that can help us to embrace a critical pedagogy stance in science education. Because if we don't have hope that things can be different, sometimes it is hard to move out of the fatalism of uh, uh, neoliberalism that they want to impose on us. So some examples of my spaces for hope, because probably many of us have different spaces for, for hope, and it would be nice if you can share them uh, with me at some point, so I can actually imagine other spaces for hope. Uh, this, these spaces are happening right now, and I have been working with some of these spaces and learning with them as well. So the first one uh, is uh, teacher communities. I, I'm working with them for my research, where different science teachers and teacher educators reflect on how they are teaching science and what opportunities and problems they realize within their own practice. For example, their biases and their blind points on issues such as uh, gender perspective, for example, or trying to find opportunities to work with teachers at the school or university outside the science to understand things like uh, astronomy from a more transdisciplinary way or the study of science, uh, etc. Also, partnerships between school and universities or local communities, not necessarily like at a school, but also other kinds of communities, using the territory to learn science, uh, inspired by their surroundings, but also reflecting on the problems that they encounter when walking to the university or when walking to the school, because we see inequalities in our walks. That is something uh, that we do every day, right? And another thing that I have seen as well uh, is a unit zero in a, in a school uh, where teachers are trying to move towards democratic classrooms through problem posing education. And in this unit, like it's the start unit for every year for all, all uh, subjects within that school. Uh, it's not part of the formal curriculum and a student have the opportunity to add issues they, they would like to explore in that year. And also to like kind of like frame the curriculum for the year with teachers. So it's like a curriculum making together. And they have been working with this approach for like several, several years. However, there is usually one problem for these spaces, which is common for all of these, the, these three examples that I'm giving, which is uh, time. These spaces are not part of what is valuable, valuable in a neoliberal culture, since they are more interested in the process rather than the product. 
and then they usually are not institutionalized and people have to find out free time to, to do these kind of things. So uh, then there is something we need to claim that is our time, that is usually a commodity. Uh, then in trying to take a more critical uh, approach to education, we can also realize the need for reclaiming better work conditions because capitalism makes everything uh, a commodity. And also we need to challenge such view to have the opportunity to work in this direction uh, because it cannot be like an isolated practice or it was gonna be like an aisle and it's not gonna be like, like a common practice for, for, every, for everyone. So uh, trying to like claim better work condition is also part of our critical uh, work. So in these spaces, if we have, uh, I have learned three tensions at least and opportunities, like tensions are opportunities to learn uh, for hope where we can develop a, like a conscientization uh, within science education to act upon these three things. Like the first one is the science curriculum. What kind of people are described in this curriculum? What kind of relations and responsibilities uh, assume? How do we use our territory to learn science, not only as a content, but also as a kind of knowledge that is needed to reflect on social justice in terms of environment, ecology, history. Uh, and one way is starting with our experiences. We live in equalities daily, so we see them and, and we need to pay attention to them. Otherwise, the students will learn that those are not problems if we don't care about them, if we don't talk about them. Uh, another one is initial education. What type of narratives are we offering to future science teachers? Are we engaging with local communities to reflect on problems that can be understood through science? Are we creating collaboration, um, collaborative spaces with the schools, not, not only for the practicum, uh, but also to learn with teachers about educational context, pedagogical praxis, like giving, giving teachers an, a different role? Uh, because if what it means to become a science teacher with ethical and democratic practices is not discussed in initial education, other narratives, are going to fill that space, narratives that are hegemonic in neoliberal societies like meritocracy, individualism, uh, elitism that in, in science is, is deeper. And also students agency, uh, how do we understand students, uh, students' role in the world? There have been key actors in recent social movements, like in my country we're having a new constitution thanks to students' uh, protests initially. So reflecting on these issues can help us to push the border of of the field of science education uh, to engage with, with critical uh, pedagogies. And finally, before I give the space to Gonzalo, um, um, as Freire said, I know with my entire body, with feelings, with passion, and also with reason. So what kind of work students learn when, when they are going to the school and university? We are always sending messages to our students uh, and to the people in general. So I think that's important to consider when we are taking a critical approach. And that's, that's what Gonzalo is going to share uh, now. Well, hello, everyone. Thank you very much for, for the invitation, Betsabe. Um, I'm here to share a piece of my ongoing research in my PhD. Uh, I'm a physics teacher as well. I'm from Chile. And, and I want to say that I'm really happy to be here sharing this uh, a small piece of my work with you. I'm happy to be sharing with my friends from Brazil uh, and all the lovely people that I can see here in, in this meeting. So this is the title of my, my project is connected with uh, Beth Savez's presentation. The title is uh, Critical Scientific Literacy and Environmental Education Through the Learning Outside the Classroom. So I would like to present um, my project, which is, is, is an approach to connect the learning of science outside the classroom with critical scientific literacy. Obviously, and as you know, we are living in this climate emergency. We are living in, in, a, in an unstable planet uh, due to anthropogenic emissions and the global warming accumulated during the time. We are living the effects on nature and, and on human systems as well. And, and as a consequence uh, of the accumulation of this carbon emission during the time the temperature is increasing, producing a lot of anomalies in all the natural and human systems, as I said recently. This is a graph very updated from last March. And as you can see, how the temperature is still increasing, affecting a lot of ecosystems in our planet. For instance, um, the atmospheric carbon dioxide is being absorbed 
by the sea, producing different reactions with the shells of a lot of animals and, and animals in, in, in our sea. As a consequence of the reaction, see so how the shell of the theropod, for instance, is being formed and is affecting the change in the pH conditions due to the exposition to the elevated CO2 concentrations. Also, another example can be seen in sea, turtle, sea turtles. Um, one example of the impact of the, of the increase of the temperature and the, and the global warming can be seen in how the proportion of female turtles is changing due that uh, the sex is connected with the temperature. So if we are having a small increase, increment in the temperature, like a 0 0.5 degrees in the temperature, we're having more female turtles. So the proportion of turtles, female turtles, is increasing, putting in danger the, um, the evolution of the, the, the species and the sea turtles in, in, in our planet. Obviously, it's not only animals and species from the natural world affected by this. We're living a big movement of people, a lot of migrations in all over the world. We are seeing a lot of floods every day in the news. And, and some people is trying to track what is happening in, in the world and the different regions. Uh, there is a specific atlas, the environmental justice atlas, which is trying to develop this concept, the ecological distribution conflict, which are social conflicts that arise because of the unique distribution of environmental benefits. This atlas at the day has 960 social environmental conflicts in our region in Latin America. That is an average of 48 conflicts for each country. And in contrast, as you can read here, the same map is showing 533 conflicts in Europe. That is a big difference with our region, showing only 14 on average for each country. In the case of Chile, we have a very good map about the environmental conflict. Uh, the, the, Institute, the National Institute of Human Rights is gathering a lot of conflicts that we are having in, in, in our country. At the date, we have 127 conflicts. Uh, 70 of them are active, uh, 33 ongoing, and 24 closed. This is very uh, bad, considering that when, when I started my, my PhD in, in London, in UCL, uh, I, I was thinking in using this map, but two years ago, we had 115 conflicts. And two years after, we have 22 more conflicts at the date. This is a very good platform, which can be uh, informed to the people what is happening with this environmental conflict, showing, for, insta for instance, what are the sectors affected by this, how the indigenous communities and the indigenous territories are affected by the environmental conflict, and it's a very good opportunity to do something and to use this platform uh, with the science curriculum. In my case, I'm using uh, a specific conflict that we have here in the metropolitan region in Santiago, the capital of Chile. And the name of this conflict is Alto Maipo. Alto Maipo is a, a company from Austria which is developing two hydroelectric power stations. One of them called Las Lajas, which is producing 277 um, megawatts of energy, and the second one in the same place, 274. But also the company is developing two different more or three more projects in the region, also in Colombia. What is happening with Altomaipo? Well, Altomaipo is uh, being developed in the Andes mountain specifically in San Jose de Maipo, which is a place very close to Santiago. As you can see here, Santiago is the small city in the picture. I don't know if you can see where the city is next to the Andes mountain. 
So Alto Maipo is a system of tunnels, a big, big system of tunnels below the mountains with 70 kilometers going through different places uh, below the mountains, trying to collect water from three rivers. One of them is the Rio Yeso, Rio Colorado, and Rio Volcan. And they are trying to use the water to produce energy. And then they are putting back again the water into another place of the, of the river, which is called Las Lajas. So they are trying to produce and use the, the energy and the project is developing a lot of tunnels and then they are putting back again the water into the river. Um, this is one of the place where the project is picking up the water. So this is like the blood system in terms of water of the city. So the company is not considering the global warming the change in the climate. They are trying to develop the, the um, new like approaches to do something in terms of the impact. They are trying to develop educational uh, programs to the community. They are uh, planting trees. They are developing a lot of things, but they are not considering what is going to be happening in 10 years or even in five. Um, in my project, I'm trying to so, use. Sorry for interrupting. Just a reminder that uh, we we were overrun four minutes. Uh, just All right. perfect. So in my project, I'm I'm trying to be sharing um, the problem with more people. I'm working with in-service teachers, pre-service teachers, two scientists, and people from CONAF, which is the which is a corporation in charge of protect uh, a place which is very close to the to the project Alto Maipo. And I'm going to try to develop a field trip. OK, I'm using the approach of scientific, a critical scientific literacy approach, which is based basically on promote transformation, eco justice and going beyond of the classic scientific literacy concept. And also I'm using some approaches from Paulo Freire to promote the dialogue and promote collaboration and a collective approach to tackle the problem. Um, I'm using this scenario. I'm using the Morado Natural Monument, which is a natural park in, located in Santiago, uh, which is very, very important to the region. It's a place visited by 15,000 people by year. And this is a place. So there is a big glacier producing basically the water that we are using in Santiago in the capital. And also is responsible for the rivers, the creation of the rivers in, in the place. And obviously we have a lot of diversity there. We have a lot of native and endemic species and foxes, condors, a big flora and fauna in the place. And what is happening with the project? Literally, Alto Maipo is going below the El Morado Natural Park. So I'm trying to use that scenario to carry out a field trip in that place with all the partnership. I'm using a research practice partnership to develop this project and trying to connect science. So this is a natural laboratory for us, but also we can promote a critical approach and a critical scientific literacy using the environmental conflict. This is the, the tunnel. So you can see how the tunnel is going below the, the Andes mountain, affecting all the, the species and affecting the ecosystems on the surface. The law in Chile is not protecting the natural park because it's based only on the surface and everything what is happening below that is not protected by the law. So you can do a lot of things below the mountains, but you can do nothing on the surface, but it's not protecting what is happening with the, with the animals and the flora and with the glacier, indeed. So um, that's my project. At the date, we are fighting 
against the project. A lot of people is moving against what is happening there. And I wanted to share this with you to contribute to Betsabe presentation. Thank you very much. Obrigado.